Um, but my name is Tony Redman. I wrote a book, New York Hardcore, 1980, 1990. Uh, right now, I'm sorry. Um, Mike is having some, Mike Judge is having some sort of family issues right now. He says he, you know, he said he was going to be here. We're still waiting for him, so I'm just going to. Sorry, you can throw tomatoes or um, tool CDs at me, whatever, you know, whatever you want to do. Um, but until the book, can I just borrow some of the book? <laughs> Thanks. Appreciate it. Um, yeah, uh, 1980, 1990. Um, book covers the first decade of New York hardcore in the city. Um, uh, it starts out with. Uh, Sort of in that like gray area of, you know, uh, the bands sort of like the Ramones, the Dictators, Blondie, um, sort of either became like touring entities or got signed to major labels. Basically, kind of became the became what they were supposed to be the antidote against sort of. And out of that void came some more younger bands, uh, most notably Stimulators with uh, Twelve Year Old Harley Flanagan playing drums. And uh, from there, there's you know. Uh, also, some bands that were in that gray area before, like a name, like a word, like hardcore, is thrown around, it was like um, the Mad, um, even Worst, uh, the Awfuls, some other bands that are sort of lost to time. But then, uh, yeah. sort of as that new American hardcore ball started rolling, uh, had like Heart Attack. Um, oh, and Nihilistics from Long Island, sort of an important band that people forget, I think they're sort of like the, the groundwork for sort of the aesthetic of New York hardcore that's sort of like just um, realistic, I don't give a shit kind of thing. Um, and uh, radio shows like no uh, Noise the Show, Fanzines like The Big Takeover, Guillotine, these are all bands that were sort of, uh, excuse me, Fanzines that were important to uh, formation. Now I have two. Yeah. Um, to the formation of the scene starting, uh, A7, uh, a club that was before CB's was uh, welcoming hardcore. And uh, I think instead of just talking aimlessly, because I wasn't planning this, I thought Mike would be here, I'm just going to maybe read a few things out of here to kind of give the, the gist of what I'm talking about here. Um, this is the first first chapter it sort of talks about the formation of uh, the early scene and uh, I'll start it off with uh, a quote from Tommy Ratt, uh, infamous New York hardcore legend, uh, Gnostic Front Warzone, Trip Six. Um, in 1980 I started going to shows in what was the New York City punk scene and I saw that evolve into, the, evolve into the hardcore scene in 1981. This was the true beginning of my life. The punk scene made me want to break away from this life I was living with my family in school. Everybody in Brooklyn was doing the same old shit listening to disco or bad rock and roll. I hopped on the train, went to CBGB's, and found an outlet where I truly belonged with other like-minded individuals. Um, after that, Donna Damage, woman who sang for a band called No Thanks, sort of um, one of the proto, kind of like peace punk bands for New York hardcore. Uh, hardcore was a rebellion against the dinosaurs. It was a rebellion against the media. It was a rebellion against everything that was going on. Uh, Kevin Crowley, vocalist for The Abused. Out of that scene came us the subset of punk, hardcore, with that anger and raw energy. It was the antithesis of what commercial music was doing. There was definitely an evolution. If you listen to our music, it's not just punk. You can hear Black Sabbath overtones in there, too. Uh, Jesse Mallon, who was uh, in Heart Attack and then you know, went on to have a pretty successful solo career. Suddenly, all these kids in a certain age group met each other right on corners around this city. Some people had hung around from the punk rock days. Most were just young kids coming from the boroughs. You'd see someone at a show or at a record store or on a street corner and say, oh, those are the guys they met at that Stiff Beaters gig. Or, hey, there's that girl with the bondage pants and the pony sneakers I saw the other week. We were all craving something, all of us at the same time. We grew up watching Uncle Floyd on UHF. We heard the Ramones. We wanted to go further. Suddenly, it felt like something was going on that us kids were truly a part of. We were making our own flyers. We had our own style of dancing and speaking. This was something that was our own. It started to grow and it had something to say. So. That kind of shows, you know, that this was a, you know, starting out as a grassroots kind of uh, kind of environment, and uh, you know, the big thing was like the Bad Brains moving from D.C. to New York. That seemed to be uh, a band to rally behind. 
and a lot of people started bands over that. And uh, here's a couple quotes to kind of drive that point home, and they're a little, there's some blue, uh, blue language, so cover, cover your ears. Uh, well, this is Drew Stone, who sang for the High and the Mighty in the Antidote. An antidote. Uh, at the time, I thought the Bad Brains were a New York band, but they transcended all space and time. They were unbelievable, a magical band. Seeing them play back then was almost like a religious, religious experience. That same energy and feeling I can compare to the Grateful Dead, where it's just magic in the room and everybody's feeling it. I saw the Bad Brains many times. You get a little taste of that magic and you want more. Uh, here's Paul Bearer, vocalist for Sheer Terror. I don't give a shit what the fuck Ian McKay or any of those other jerk-offs say. The Bad Brains wouldn't have been shit if they didn't move to New York. No one would know who the fuck they were if they stayed in D.C. They would have been fucking unknown, and that's the fucking truth. So, uh, and uh, Steve Poss, uh, drummer for the Cavity Creeps, and just sort of another New York legend. Uh, D.C. wouldn't have eventually dissing themselves from the Bad Brains. They wouldn't have gone along with the pot and the Rasta stuff. They were probably happy to get rid of them and send them to New York. So there's that. Um, Oh, a quick thing from the Nihilistics chapter, because they were sort of coming in from Long Island in like 1979, 1980, and uh, they weren't being accepted on Long Island, obviously, and they weren't being accepted in New York, as everybody thinks, in New York thinks people from Long Island are um, suburban guidos or something. Um, so this is the singer Ron Rancid talking about, our first show was outside during the winter in the parking lot adjacent to an American Legion Hall in Long Island. We ran extension cords out the window. Halfway through the set, we got cut off. We all ended up getting locked up. Our first New York show was an audition at CBGB's. You had to show up during the day. Hilly Crystal said, you remind me of the Dent Boys, just way more animated and menacing. After you told me that, I pissed in their ice maker. That was the summer of 1980. So there's that. Um, but then eventually, you know, we have, we get into like the meat of, I guess, what everybody wants to know, like, you know, the AF and Chromags and you know A7 and things like that. Um, I don't know. Does anybody have any questions, concerns, complaints, anything? I have a question. Sure. How come you took that original picture and cut it shorter? I I'm actually right here. I didn't design. <laughs> I didn't design the cover. <laughs> no, I'm just I'm just curious because I have the original picture from Ken Salerno. Yeah. And I know this guy behind me. He's like no longer in the picture. Oh. I was just curious. That's all. Oh, I don't. I mean, they just did that to fit the fit it on the cover. I think. I don't. I don't think it was anything malicious. <laughs> 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 yeah, it's fine. Um, I don't know. I mean, yeah. What's uh, yes, sir. What's, yes. <laughs> what's something that you didn't know going into the book that you you know really struck out, uh, like stood out to you after interviewing everybody? Um, hmm. I don't know. I think the thing is, like, I I was what I really wanted to find out more about that I didn't. I didn't get to delve into was sort of that, like I was saying, that sort of gray area before there was like a hardcore scene. There were all these bands that were sort of younger. Um, they were playing like Maxes and, you know, like Shrapnel were coming in, from like Green Monster Magnet, and then like, you know, these bands like The Victims, The Violators. Are these bands that are undocumented that like played a lot with even worse, like this band called The Awfuls, that apparently were just like 15 year old kids who couldn't play. They did like Sesame Street covers, like our, stuff like that that I, I wanted to know more about. Um, but a lot of those people, couldn't be found apparent. I think like one of the guys in all the awfuls it became like like I think Elliot Sharp was in that band. It was like a newly like free jazz guitarist dude. Apparently he was in that band. Um, so that gray area is kind of interesting because a lot of those people were hangovers from like punk rock. And even then like you know like hardcore is supposed to be this thing that you know like punk rock is supposed to wipe a slate clean and then hardcore came like even wipe the slate clean the punk like punk wasn't good. So a lot of those bands were still like looking punk and like people were shaving their heads like, you know, get out of here, like that's, that's over. But um, you know, there's other you know, you know, funny Billy Psycho stories. You know, uh, you know, people you know, Craig Satari climbing, going mountain climbing, and going to the top of the hill, and Billy Psycho was eating a hard-boiled egg and drinking a forty at the top of the hill in somewhere out of state, New York. Um, and, you know, you know, stuff like that. Like I didn't know like Paris had a, a, such a background where he played. Like he played in the Mad for a little while, and like you know, stuff like that. Um, and also, I, I I went back and listened to a lot of bands that I just stopped, not stopped listening to, but like you know, like something like the Crumb Suckers. That sounds great to me now. Like then I was just like, yeah, this is too noodly. Like you know, there's a lot of 
a lot of bands I, I didn't listen to the first time around. A lot of like later bands that I didn't pay attention to that I, I started to like. But I don't, know, I don't know if that answered the question. I don't know if you wanted like a good fight story. I'm sorry. But, and just a follow up. Yes. Um, yes, sir. Is there something that you didn't have room for in the book that you? Really oh yeah. Like yeah. I mean, like if it was up to me, like the whole thing is like you gotta like separate the personal sort of like. You know, if it was up to me, we'd have like 300 pages on like Crackdown or something, you know, like, but you got to like, you know, you got to step back and look at like, you know, I remember when I was just started gathering all the information and I would like, all the quotes I would get, I was like, all right, like, this all goes over here, this all goes over here, this all goes over here. And then like, I would look at that stuff and be like, ah, that might be a little too much about like, you know, outburst, <laughs> you know, like Never. stuff like that. Yeah, well, yeah, I agree with that. But, you know, you got to kind of pull the reins in. Um, and you throw in some stuff that you're, you know, personally don't really care about, but it, you know that it's a, a vital part of it, so, you know, you talk about it. But, you know, this uh, this thing seems to have some legs, so maybe we'll do second editions with, you know, with 300 pages worth of outburst you know, and maximum penalty <laughs> and uh, altercation and all those great things. Uh, anything else? Please, I feel weird. What did you want? What what made you decide on this picture though for the cover? I didn't decide on that picture actually. Really? It was the publisher. Okay. I, I actually wanted a different picture on there, and they really really wanted it. Um, not to say it's a bad picture or anything. Uh, it was one of those things where they put it out there, and it once it was out there, you couldn't take it back. You know? What picture did you want? Yeah. I wanted actually the picture that's on the back cover. I wanted that that rest in pieces picture. I wanted that on the front, but they thought it was a little too like. You can't identify like they wanted someone where it's like it's a vocalist you identify right. it and it's someone that's like from an important band like just have a bunch of people running around like ah like they're like they identify AJ enough on the back yeah 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 exactly and it was funny you say that because when I showed this to Armand I was like he looked he was like hey that's AJ from enough I was like but that's you there and he's like really oh, oh cool like he was like oh, that's cool but yeah no I would rather have that picture but. People pay the bills. People pay for this stuff, and you, you go along with it. Um, anything else? Hey, yeah. uh, what made you decide to write a book about New York hardcore? Is there any other like books that you've read that you thought were missing things, or? Well, it kind of. I think um, it wasn't it wasn't on purpose. I think, but it, it just happened that way. It's like, you know, the the that American hardcore movie. Not I'm not like dissing it, but like it seemed like the Midwest. It was, you know, cover like SSD, and then it was like, oh, there's something going on in the Midwest, and I show like 10 seconds of negative approach. Like, mm -hmm. And I just, so I think there was that, and I think there was also like, anything that was about New York was more like about whatever, like the physicality of it, or like, these guys are crazy. Like, what about the music? Like, music's good. Why can't we talk about that? It was more like, there's a picture of bags outside, like, biting someone's finger off. Like, I don't know. Like, I just think there, the two things that I wrote about were just two scenes that, were super important to um, whatever the evolution of the music, but didn't really get the deserve what they deserved. And um, I wrote this article for the Village Voice about a A7 reunion show that happened in like 2008. I just ended up doing too many interviews than I should have because I was just really excited to do it. And that was just when I was starting my first book, Whatever Something You're Not. So I was like, oh, like I'll just kind of put this on the back burner and see where it goes. Um, and I did keep it on the back burner for a while just because I would go back and kind of think about it and take notes. I'm like, this is too much. I can't deal with this. I'm an idiot. Um, but then, whatever. I got a little, a little more encouragement and uh, put it together. But I think the reason I did it is just that last period. I was always interested in the 80 to 85 because I wasn't really there for that much of that. And I always thought that was interesting that I kind of started, started in a sort of punky kind of thing and then it became like, super aggro, you know, used mouse in front. And then, you know, the 85 to 90 part I was a little more a part of because I did a fanzine and I interviewed those guys and, you know, it was something that I, I really um, connected with most of it. So that, that's basically it. And I just think it's a really good story. And if anybody else did it, it would have been Yoda fights or something. Like, I just wanted more about the music and, you know, why those guys did it. So that, that was kind of my, my reason. Anyone else? No? Hey, Tony. Hey, question. So whether with this book, the Detroit book, just any of the stuff you've done in hardcore fanzines, yeah. if you could 
if there's been any interview throughout that whole process, has there been anything that you felt was something that really encapsulated or motivated you to do this book, to do any fanzine where you just felt like, wow, this is something that just has to get out to people because it really documents. Oh, you mean like interviews I did for the book or what? Just in general, whether it's with this book or anything. Jeez. I don't really remember much about doing interviews like when I was a kid for a fanzine. Like I remember like things about it, but I remember ever being like blown away by any uh, statement anybody said. I, I just don't think I was, I don't think I was bright enough to take it all in at that point. Um, but as far as doing the, this book, there was, um, you know, one interview that sticks out for me is uh, with Dwayne uh, Rossingle, who ran some records. Because he was like an older guy, it's not like he really had any um, any connection with this stuff. It wasn't like he was going to see these matinees or something. He was just like a guy that was like, these kids need an outlet, they need a place to sell this stuff, they need a place to hang out, and they need a place to exchange, you know, ideas. It was like a cultural hub. And he was just sort of a, like, you know, um, the whatever, the rod, lightning rod, or whatever you want to call it, to, you know, attract all these kids. And without him, you know, they've said it, they, there's interviews in the book where, like, guys from Sick said, you know, we wouldn't, you know, the first day we came in there, he bought 20 of our demos. Like, what, what sane person buys 20 of anybody's yeah. demo, you know? Like, he just had, like, a blind, uh, you know, blind encouragement for these kids just because he was, yeah. thought it was important these kids were doing this, you know? They'd knock over a bunch of silver sharpies. Um, so I think out of this book, I think his is mo the most important because it, it really talks about like the spirit of the, mu of the music rather than like, you know, whatever, the, the shows or the moshing or, you know, sure. moshing, what have you. Um, so yeah, I think that that's kind of like my favorite one because it was hard, it like, doesn't really talk much, so it was, it was cool for him to, to do that. Hey, how's it going? Are there any bands that were uh, difficult to contact or difficult to interview? Uh, the, the bad brands were kind of hard to, to track down and they were kind of difficult to interview as well. Uh, but, um, you know, there's certain people that just, you know, you got to keep, like, kind of plowing through it. Like, uh, someone I think of that I, like, ten times we were like, oh, we're going to do this interview and never, excuse me, never came to anything was like Tommy Victor and Prong and, like, just people that are busy and, and work. You know, so it was it was never anyone being like, screw you, I don't want to talk to you. It was more like timing and busy, you know, me trying to do stuff, them trying to do stuff. But again, hopefully this is something that we can go back and, you know, retract, you know, put more stuff in, you know. Yep. Um, any bands that you have discovered through the writing of this book that you think should be mentioned in your hardcore but aren't necessarily considered? Well, it, uh, like, just not, not. Like, like. Life. Like bands that nobody's really ever heard of, but are you think are important to the scene and the time? Uh, well, yeah, there's tons of those. I mean, uh, I don't know, like, but I mean, this is all like preaching to the converted. I think, like, whatever, like, all you know, altercation, outbursts. And I think, as far as the early stuff, like I said before, I think the nihilistics are a band that like no one really points a finger to as being like super important of the the way the the music sounded and the, like the, just the. Um, lyrical content and just this really like I don't give it like you know realistic uh, lyrical content uh, and you know there's other people again from that earlier period that were really important um, in get, just getting that information out outside of New York like the mob I think are a band that don't get the recognition they deserve because Jack was a guy that was the first guy to hey I'm gonna press my band's record and then he was the only guy in New York that would try to get out of town bands to come in and play and then you know, hey, we're gonna go play with Jerry's kids. We're gonna go play with uh, Minor Threat. Like, I think that guy doesn't get the um, respect he deserves for like trying to be that guy, like trying to be like the Ian McKay or the Al Burrell or like the Corey Rusk of like the one guy in the scene that's gonna like because he gave money. You know, he gave money for Urban Waste to do their record. Um, Ignacio Front paid for their own records, but he took like 500 of them and he distributed them all across the country. Like, so. Um, as far as an individual, I think that guy doesn't get the um, acknowledgement they deserve. But I mean, that whole late 80s part of New York hardcore, you know, all those demo bands, all the bands, most of the bands on uh, the New Breed Con, like, you know, like stuff like that. Um, because they were like sort of, it's funny now when you think about it, like those bands were like bands that were like third on a bill, but now people think like, the great, like biggest thing in the world, you know? and. Um, so as time went on, a lot of those bands became 
influential. Like, you know, the altercations then, uh, even like pressure release, or I guess for half New York, half Connecticut, you know, and all those, you know, things like that. Anything else? Oh, hey, I got that guy. <laughs> Anybody you, you interviewed that you were surprised what they were like, you know, them as like a legendary type of person, and then when you interviewed them, you were like, oh, this person's locked in, and I thought they were going to be. Yeah, like, yeah. Well, I mean, like some of like, like you know, it's kind of weird now to think about those guys, like like Roger Moret, Moret. Like, I always saw that guy from so far away, and like, you know, for him, just like, yeah, come to my house, we'll do the interview, we'll sit out in my backyard, and you know, drink coffee, and it's like, she just you know, four hour interview, just talking and talking, and it's just like, you know, now that I would think he'd be like, screw you, but it was just so weird to think of that guy just to be like, oh, yeah, let's, let's sit in the backyard and talk, and like. I'll tell you anything you want to know, you know? And that was, you know, like, someone like that. And then, um, who else? Still, well, I knew Stigma was going to be a good interview. But just, again, such a guy that's just like, had, like, I could have just been like, I'm going to write a book about gardening. He'd be like, yeah, sure, let's talk. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, you don't, yeah he's, he's like awesome. the greatest guy in the world. So, like, I think, you know, I think it was more the fact of, like, being a kid and, like, seeing those bands so many times and, like, you know, even though hardcore was supposed to be a thing where like there was no barrier, like they were still yeah, that's the closest like to a rock star it was, you know, and like it's kinda cool that they were just so down to earth and happy. Like, you know, like so many people tried to like discourage me to doing this, like, oh you better watch it, like this guy's not gonna like it, this guy's not gonna like it. And then like they're just oh yeah, sure. Well, yeah, that's a good idea. Why didn't anybody do this before? You know, they nobody it's not you know, it's not like uh the big deal that everybody it makes it out to be. But I think like those two guys were probably the the um the most interesting interviews. And like all the other guys like you know like Purcell and Ray and all these guys, guys are always nice. Like they're not, they're not gonna be like, no, I'm not gonna talk to you. So that was fine. I'm just gonna have a mint. Uh anything else? One more. Sure. Um one here. If a kid walked up to you and just discovered you moved and you were to recommend one album for him to start off with what would you think? Like New York in general, or yeah. crap. Um, oh, victim in pain. No, oh, I mean, I last night we did like our book thing in Philadelphia, and uh, I, I I said this and I thought it was it came out of my mouth, and I was like, oh yeah, like that record is both flawless and full of flaws at the same time. Like it's the flaws that make it. Everything's out of tune. Like it's you know it's. I was recorded on like a borrowed 16 track that they had to return by the end of like the recording session. Like, it's yeah, it's like, it's the flaws that make it what it is. And even like United Blood is like, you know, if you want to be like pretentious about it, that record sounds like like a, like a caveman etching or something. You know, like it's just so primitive, but that's what makes it what it is. You know, but I think Victim and Pain will probably, yeah, like vinyl, yeah, that would be it. Anything else? Best ten minute record ever. What's that? The best ten minute record ever. <laughs> well, my my memory of that is my brother bringing that record home, and I just read about them in like Max Mark and Roll, and they were like, oh, you know, they were like yellow. They were just like slandering them. So, from what I thought of them, and then seeing that cover, I was like, oh crap! <laughs> like I see the back cover, I'm like, oh crap! But that gate, and I remember just like, it's no hardcore record that gate folds, you know? And you just like, it's just like a mind blowing thing to put that record on, and you're like. Like looking at you, oh, slides over. <laughs> no, no, you're right. I, yeah, yeah. I have actually framed them in. in oh, awesome. Game, but yeah, like gate fold, you know. Yeah, no. But I, I actually saw them their first show ever. The zoo crew as a zoo crew. I, I no, I actually saw them when Roger actually first joined. Oh, okay. Was replaced. Uh, he was in the psychos. Billy Milano yeah. took over for him. Yeah. It was actually not so fun. Mental <laughs> abuse, uh, the psychos, and bodies in panic. Oh wow. It's like 31 years ago was in it? a firehouse in Tom Brewer. Oh, wow. It wasn't like Patrick's or something like that? No, I didn't know Patrick's there, sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, oh, that's cool. No, I never, the first, my brother started taking me to hardcore shows in the, like, the summer of 1984, and uh, I saw like Calls for Alarm, and I saw Kraut, and that was always funny because, that you know. That was Patrick. You he, probably saw him there, right? I saw Death Before Dishonor at uh, Court Tavern. They opened up for JFA. And uh, I know that was a weird gray area because that was like my entrance into it. But like, you know, I saw like Black Flag and like, 
whatever, like nothing against it, but you know, like like Terry Rollins and shorty shorts and long hair, I was like, oh, okay, what? what? But then seeing like Cause for Alarm or like Death Before Summer, I was like, oh, okay, yeah, like this is, this is what I was looking for, you know? It's, that was a, a weird time because I think New York was, that's when New York flourished because they were like fully hardcore while everybody was like kind of falling off the wayside. You know? It was like, you know, the whole thing with the City Gardens and going back and forth, you know what I mean, to yeah. the shows. Yeah, yeah. I mean, City Gardens, you know, you went to a matinee on Sundays. I mean, I go back with Jimmy Gustav, all them guys, and it's like, I'm look, I looked at, you know, Skinner through the book, and it's like, it's, it's just a great memory, you know what I mean? Like, Sundays, I mean, if you come on bloody on the train, you were, you had a, you know, it was a good time. time you know I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. All right. Uh, is that enough prodding? Anything? Anybody? No? No? Good. Okay. Um, well, I'm sorry about Mike. Uh, beyond my control. Uh, maybe he'll show up when we're all leaving. Uh, yeah, he still hasn't gotten back to touch me. So uh, I apologize for that. But um, I'll be here. I'll sign books and uh, chatting, what have you. Um, that's it. Thanks for coming. And. Is that good? Does anybody have any more questions or not? No? Okay. All right, yeah, I'll sign books. Thanks. Yeah, that was a little discouraging.